Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Since the early 2000s, Japan has been experiencing a resurgence of an early 20th century blood type discrimination fad. This is a popular practice, similar to astrology, that relies on personality divination based on blood type, A, O, A, B, or B. Like astrology, it is a set of generalized ideas about personality types that corresponds with blood types. Like racial stereotypes, it is a biologically determined set of fallacies that people use to justify discriminating against people with, quote, undesirable blood types, specifically B and tangentially AB. Hmm. Though Japan is one of the most technologically advanced nations in the world, this superstition has permeated popular imagination, and discrimination against type Bs is known as blood harassment or burahara. This is, of course, no more or less unreasonable than reading your daily horoscope, uh, just as common in the United States as Borahara is in Japan. But in a 98% ethnically homogeneous Japan, type Bs can be passed over for promotion, harassed, or discriminated against simply because they are perceived to be phenotypically hot-headed, wild, and unreliable. While this obviously isn't predicated on centuries of oppression and discrimination like that which Jews experienced or continue to experience in Europe, or that Black, Native American, Latinx, or hell, even East Asians experience in the United States, mm -hmm. what's particularly interesting about the Burahara phenomenon is that it is rooted in some of the same racial science that contributed to the development of racist discrimination against Jews and people of color in the 20th century. The markers of modernity eugenic science, medicine, and democracy ushered in an era of particularly nasty discriminatory practices in the U.S., Germany, the rest of Europe, and indeed, Japan. I'm Avril Earls. And I'm Sarah Hanley-Cousins. And we are your historians for this episode of DIG. <laughs> Before we dig <laughs> into the story of the Japanese eugenics movement, we want to pause to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters, but especially our auger and excavator level patrons. Christopher, Colin, Maggie, Peggy, and Lauren, you are too generous, and we are eternally grateful for your support. Listener, if you are not yet a patron, you can be. We are halfway to our goal of $300 a month. And at $300 a month, we'll finally, finally, finally be able to upgrade our four-year-old recording equipment. Go to patreon.com slash dig podcast to learn more. I approached this episode wanting to write about eugenics in Japan. The short story is that Japan adopted eugenic science from the West, along with a great many other things, because it happened that eugenic science was emerging as a useful concept at the end of the 19th century, just when Japan was modernizing. That didn't seem like a particularly compelling story to me. Uh, then I was reading an article by Jennifer Robertson about the shifting ideas about blood in Japan and the way that blood and heredity were adapted into Japanese scientific thought. And the author mentioned a blood type fad uh, currently in 2002 when she was writing the essay, Gripping Japan. Mm. While there isn't much in the way of academic scholarship in English the only language I'd be able to read it in, <laughs> on blood type discrimination. And some Japanese psychologists and other social scientists have worked really hard to debunk this myth to little avail. It quickly became apparent that there is a link between this current issue and the eugenics movement. As Robertson shows, 20th century Japanese ideas about blood were very much entangled with Japanese ideas about race, marriage, and eugenics. There is more to the 21st century issue of blood type discrimination, and I promise, promise, promise that we will get back to it. But first, Japan, eugenics, and modernity. 
For about 250 years under the Tokugawa shogunate, Japan was closed to foreigners. The Sakoku policy of isolationism decreed that any foreigner who set foot in Japan was to be executed. The American Commodore Matthew Perry, not unfortunately the Matthew Perry of Friends fame, um, sailed to Japan's coasts with superior military technology, a promise of domination through unequal trade agreements, and the forced end of the Sakoku. Rather than accept this domination by the West, Japanese reformist leaders allied against the shogun and overthrew the shogunate. For the 15-year-old Emperor Meiji, who ascended to the throne in 1867, and his supporters, resisting Western colonization would take more than dismantling the remnants of Japan's feudal system. Japan would have to become Western. In addition to major political, economic, and social changes, Japan quickly adopted an aggressive imperial program in East Asia to rival the encroaching American, British, French, and Dutch empires. Is this not the setting of our favorite book? Of the clockmaker of Filigree Street? Yeah. It is. Yeah, it yeah, is yeah. Because remember, he wears nice suits. He does wear nice suits oh, because that's Western. I love that book oh, so much. That's so good. Anyway, anyway. The leaders of the revolution established close relations with the Prussian state before the German Empire was established in 1871 and worked very closely with German advisors throughout the Restoration. In order to facilitate the process of rapid modernization in industry, in military organization, in government, in fashion, in agriculture, and so on, the Japanese state hired foreign advisors. Some scholars have estimated that as many as 3,000 Oyatoi Gaikokujin worked for the Meiji state between 1868 and 1912, and more for private entities. Most were German, though French, British, American, and Italians also worked for both the public and private sector for the modernizing Japan. So the new state was nominally built on the restoration of the emperor to his throne. In reality, he was expected to consult the leaders who'd done the work to overthrow the shogun, who quickly consolidated their economic and military power after the dismantlement of the samurai-centered feudal system. And in most ways, the restoration was wildly successful as a westernization, modernization, and Japanization movement. The Meiji leaders re-examined and redefined what Japanese-ness meant in the early decades of the Restoration. They established a German-style parliamentary system, built a new educational system utilizing French structure in American texts, and adopted a new criminal code modeled on France and Germany's. From 1881 on, Germany was by far the preferred foreign influencer. They also created a civic ideology predicated on the significance of the emperor. We talked about this a bit in our Shintoism episode. The emperor in Japan was, even during the Tokugawa period, supposed to be descended from the goddess of the sun. So it suited the new state to create a cult around the emperor, employ Shintoism as a formal state religion, and invoke tradition to move Japanese people into modernity. I do want to emphasize that this is not particularly unique. We don't want this episode or any of our treatments of East Asian, Ottoman, uh, or other histories to encourage Orientalism. Right, right. Mussolini mobilized a Roman imperial past to invigorate the Italian fascist state. Mm -hmm. The British hold tight to their antiquated monarchy still today, of which the king is the head of the Anglican Church. Or the queen. Or the queen. Right. Yeah. King or queen. And... If anyone is susceptible to culty kinds of leadership, it's white Americans. Mm -hmm. Goop, mm -hmm. Charles Manson, Jones, the Scientology guy, mm -hmm. Donald Trump, et right, cetera. Right, right, yeah. It's especially linking to a more glorious, better past. Exactly. Right? An yes. imagined past, yes. a fictionalized yeah. past. So yeah. this is not, you know, this is this not, is not something is not that's unique. unique to Japan. Yeah. yeah. But as we discussed in that episode, the Shintoism episode, uh, the Shintoism that the Japanese state employed in their pursuit of modernity was reinvented for those purposes. Tradition can be fabricated and is often fabricated like anything else. Japan's success as a modernized state was debuted in the 1894-95 Sino-Japanese War. Fortified with a Western military and navy, Japan trounced China, forcing them to recognize Korean independence, cede Taiwan and several smaller islands to Japan for rule, and open China up to Japanese trade. Though Russia, the U.S., and Britain forced Japan out of Liaodong province, 
the other concessions established Japan as an imperial force in East Asia. Eugenics as a specific science was a Western phenomenon. While states and scientists all over the world have conceived of ways to control populations and categorize people for centuries, millennia even, the scientific community that we call eugenicists developed in the West and out of Western social and biological scientific inquiries in the 18th and 19th centuries. As we saw in Marissa's episode, Eugenics in the Making, this is evident in the 18th century, in particular with the development of human typology science, population hygiene concerns, and public sanitation efforts. In the 19th century, building on the hypotheses and practices that Marissa was talking about, scientists interested in genetics, inheritance, and species development found a breadth of new research on which to build population control and categorization. The eugenics movement was founded by Sir Francis Galton, cousin of Charles Darwin, excuse me, half cousin of Charles Darwin, <laughs> uh, an English self-proclaimed statistician, sociologist, psychologist, anthropologist, geographer, meteorologist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, novelist. He wrote a really terrible novel. Um, he was like a lot of upper class white men of his time, a jack of all trades and master of none, um, an academic a quote-unquote academic, with an interest in the human condition, dabbling in a little bit of everything. When Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, he was building on ideas that the community of 19th century natural scientists called evolution. Social scientists like Herbert Spencer and Galton then took those ideas about biology, natural selection, and Mendelian genetics to justify their various phenotype and race hierarchy pseudosciences. Galton coined the term eugenics in 1883, but he wrote widely on race typologies well before. In Hereditary Talent and Character, he wrote, There are certain marked types of character, justly associated with marked types of feature and of temperament. We hold axiomatically that the latter are inherited, the case being too notorious and too consistent with the analogue afforded by brute animals to render argument necessary, and we therefore infer the same of the former. For instance, the face of the combatant is square, coarse, and heavily jawed. It differs from that of the ascetic, the voluptuary, the dreamer, and the charlatan. Still more strongly marked than, the, than these are the typical features and characters of different races of men, the Mongolians, Jews, Negroes, Gypsies, and American Indians. Severally propagate their binds, and each kind differs in character and intellect, as well as in color and shape from the other four. They, and a vast number of other races, form a class of instances worthy of close investigation, in which peculiarities of character are invariably transmitted from the parents to the offspring. <laughs> I like your Galton accent. Mm-hmm. Eugenics, which is from the Latin for good birth, was Galton's plan for improving society through manipulation of the human population. Galton endeavored to apply the hereditary sciences and evolutionary concepts popularized by his predecessors like Gregor Mendel, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and Darwin to human social quote-unquote evolution. At the start, Galton promoted positive eugenics. This approach encouraged desirable individuals to reproduce and rewarded good births with maternal and infant health care and other social services. He founded the Eugenics Educational Society in 1907, renamed the Eugenics Society in 1926, of which he served as president until 1928. Ultimately, the society, which was international in its membership, also advocated for negative eugenics initiatives, discouraging undesirable individuals to reproduce, encouraging family limitation through access to effective birth control methods, as in the case of eugenicists Margaret Sanger and Marie Stopes, or more insidiously through forced sterilization, euthanasia, and other population restrictions. In my episode of of this series, I'll be talking about the 1930s German implementation of forced sterilization and euthanasia to eliminate German people with disabilities. And in her episode, Elizabeth will talk about the use of sterilization as a primary birth control method in 20th century Puerto Rico. Many of these methods were employed by the various states and individuals who embraced eugenic ideas and outlooks. Japan, which started adopting Western sciences during the earliest years of the Meiji Restoration, imported these eugenic ideas, sometimes verbatim. 
As Japanese eugenicists and policymakers forged a new vision of a Japanese race, they approached the task much in the same way that they did the rest of their modernization, by blending both Western and Japanese ideas. In many ways, when the Japanese began developing their own eugenics movement, they were able to import a ready-made model from the West. Japan was not part of the first International Eugenics Congress in 1911, but it was part of the second. Delegates from Japan joined members from Europe, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Cuba, Venezuela, El Salvador, Uruguay, India, and Siam in New York in September 1921 at the Second International Eugenics Congress. Like the Italian connection to the ancient Romans or a German Teutonic race, the Japanese tied their national identity to the ancient Yamato people. The Yamato were an ethnic group that originally inhabited mainland Japan and was understood to be distinct from the other ethnic groups of the archipelago. There were two schools of eugenic thought for how the Yamato race could enter a modern era. The first, a mixed blood theory, first articulated in 1884, advocated for the intermarriage of Japanese males and Anglo-females. This would, per eugenic thought, establish a taller, heavier, more physically superior Japanese race. The second position was a pure blood position, which proposed that the Japanese had to eschew interbreeding with any and all Europeans, because to do so would produce a race that was neither European nor Japanese and would make Japan an international failure. This idea dominated until 1939, when imperialist successes made the mixed blood idea popular again, this time, though, advocating for the intermarriage of Japanese men with Manchurian women, in which, according to one Japanese eugenicist, mixing superior Japanese blood with inferior Manchurian blood would stimulate the development and civilization of inferior people by producing hybrid offspring who would mature as natural political leaders. Throughout this period, however, all eugenicists agreed that the common Japanese practice of consanguineous marriage was something that would have to stop. And yes, we mean that, like the nobility of Europe, the Japanese tended to marry their cousins, their uncles, their aunts. Mm -hmm. Japanese scientists took to genetics fairly late, in the 1890s, compared to other Western sciences. The major schools of thought in late 19th century uh, genetics were Mendelian and Lamarckian. In 1908, Japanese geneticist Toyama Kamataro proposed applying Mendelian laws to marriage criteria, but the rest of the Japanese geneticists were reluctant to apply Mendelian answers to human problems. Much of the eugenic scholarship reaching Japan from Europe and America labeled the Japanese as inferior, mm -hmm. along with the rest of East Asia. Japanese and Chinese eugenicists had to grapple with defining an ideal national character using a scientific model that denigrated the East Asian peoples. Right. Yutsen Juliet Chung argues that Japanese and Chinese eugenicists thus turned to a Lamarckian outlook on human genetics rather than a simpler Mendelian trait inheritance model. Japanese eugenicists were not actually Lamarckian biologists themselves, but Lamarckian ideas are there in their rhetoric and approach to envisioning an ideal Japanese race. This would allow Japanese eugenicists to isolate desirable inheritable traits as well as undesirable traits like disease rather than breeding whiteness into the race. This was pursued through initiatives like better prenatal care, medicine, and obstetrics to cultivate better children, population politics, and policies that would promote infant health. Lamarckian genetics was more useful, as it is premised on inheritable habits rather than on exclusively genetic material. In this way, the Japanese could reimagine the Japanese race as Western and modern and pass that on to the next generation. Like the Europeans, the Japanese eugenic organization identified what they perceived to be desirable and undesirable inheritable traits. The Japanese also tended to, as Jennifer Robertson points out, collapse biology and culture, and thus held either, or quote, held either explicitly or implicitly Lamarckian views on race formation and racial temperament. A blended system of westernization and Japanization 
might be, for example, encouraging boys and men to adapt Western fashions, mm-hmm. haircuts, three-piece suits, and the like, while simultaneously expecting women and girls to continue representing Japanese tradition through historical costume and hairstyle. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. Very interesting. While in the United States, eugenicists had very early effects, with examples like the 1907 Indiana sterilization law and the 1908 Oklahoma anti-miscegenation law, eugenic ideals were not introduced into Japanese public policies until the 1930s. As in their military and political modernization, Japanese eugenicists looked mostly to the German example. And Germany, of course, did look to the United States as an example of eugenicist laws, particularly their forced sterilization program, uh, their anti-miscegenation laws, and the 1924 immigration restriction laws. The German way of thinking about nation and racial fitness was replicated in Japan in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s with sometimes severe consequences. Even as the Japanese crafted a superior racial profile for themselves, they effectively orientalized other East Asian nations. Taiwan and Okinawa to start, then Manchuria after their landmark victory over the Russian Empire in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, and later during the Taisho government's aggressive East Asian co-prosperity sphere expansion, Korea, China, the Philippines, and beyond. In 1925, the Japanese Eugenic Association formed. While most American eugenicists were genetic scientists, most Japanese eugenicists were physicians. In 1925, 58 members of the Japanese Eugenic Association were physicians. Two were educators, eight were journalists, and eight were listed as other. The profession of the eugenicists shaped, in a lot of ways, the trajectory of the eugenics movement in Japan. Scientists and physicians were excluded from influential positions in government until after World War I. After 1914, though, the physician profession was important to the development of the Japanese Empire. Science and medicine outreach were used for imperial efforts. In 1911, Japan sent 98 doctors to China to treat those wounded in the Chinese Revolution. In 1925, Japan founded the Natural Science Research Institute in Shanghai, thanks to uh, the concessions that the Chinese had to make to Japan as a result of the Boxer Rebellion. By 1927, Chinese doctors were trained in Japan. These friendly-seeming efforts were intended to foster good relations with other East Asian nations, opening them up to future rule by the Japanese. In 1930, the Japanese eugenicists replicated the emerging German obsession with Rassenhygiene, The Japanese Eugenic Association changed its name to the Japanese Racial Hygiene Association. We're just going to call it the JRHA. JRHA. For now on. The JRHA defended Nazi exclusionary acts against Jews. In comparison, the Chinese eugenic leaders, like Pan Guangdong, criticized Nazi race hygiene and diverged from the Japanese in the 1930s when the Japanese then also adopted the language of race hygiene. From the early 1930s, the Chinese preferred rhetoric of national health and encouraged interbreeding of Han and frontier ethnicities to rejuvenate stamina and improve genetic makeup. When Japanese eugenicists finally started to have some influence over policymaking, their focus was on public health initiatives and not particularly on the more blood-based genetic goals of the Nazi regime. Germany was largely influenced by racist American eugenics. Japan was motivated to pursue eugenics because of public health crises, both real and imagined. There was a tuberculosis epidemic in Japan between 1880 and 1900, which only declined after World War II. 200 per 100,000 deaths were attributed to tuberculosis. Leprosy was also quite a problem. In 1900, there were 30,359 lepers in Japan. In 1906, there were 23,819. In 1940, there were still 11,366. Meanwhile, by 1930, there were fewer than 1,000 in the United States. Japan had the second highest number of people with leprosy in the world, next to China. Venereal disease was also rampant in Japan, particularly among youths conscripted into the modernizing Japanese military. There were 11,326 cases of VD in 1933, 
and 70% of those cases were attributed to young soldiers having sex with infected sex workers. A tale as old as time. A 1933 survey of sex workers in Japan concluded that of 1.9 million sex workers, 64,422 had an active STI. These are obviously not hereditary issues. Japanese racial hygienists use eugenic ideas to support their public health initiatives. Leprosy was considered an epidemic in need of address even before the physicians gained any kind of influence in public policymaking. As early as 1907, the Japanese Diet or Parliament passed state legislation to round up homeless people with leprosy. Later, in 1926, eugenicist Takaho Rokuro suggested that the Japanese could purify their racial blood by creating segregated leper colonies, a national asylum, and detention hospitals for the worst lepers, those who raped, gambled, drank, etc. In Japan, as in Europe, lepers were associated with a range of sexual deviants and other vices, as Marissa discussed in her Walking Corpses episode. Eugenicists also suggested sterilization for lepers who wanted to live a married life. Leprosy is non-hereditary, which Japanese scientists knew, but eugenicists still cataloged it as a barrier to their racial hygiene. In addition to formal legislation, Japanese eugenics, still mostly physician-led, sought to improve racial hygiene through literal fitness. Nagai Hisomu, one of the leaders of the eugenics movement in Japan, wrote a treatise in 1933 on physical activity for creating a healthier race. He proposed that the Japanese needed more exercise, needed to stop drinking alcohol, and needed to consume more animal products like their Western counterparts. Animal products were not abundant in Japan itself, and these would come from colonies, particularly those established on the continent. Hisomu's vision fit into the imperialist slant that Japanese eugenics and modernization took in the early 20th century. Notably, historian Jennifer Robertson suggests that Hisomu was by far the most outspoken proponent of negative eugenics in 1930s Japan. He supported induced abortions and forced sterilization for those deemed unfit, including alcoholics, lepers, the mentally ill, criminals, the physically disabled, homosexuals, and even those with blood type B. Mm -hmm. In lockstep with Nazi racial hygiene policies, the Japanese government proposed the National Eugenic Bill in 1934. Assembled by race hygienists and eugenicists, the 1934 bill advocated sterilization to prevent hereditary feeble-mindedness, mental diseases, venereal disease, alcoholism, tuberculosis, and leprosy, and was one of a handful of legislative acts passed in the 1930s. It also required that potential marriage partners obtain complete physicals before tying the knot and prevented people with STIs from marrying. Channeling the core values of their physician members' goals for the eugenics movement, the 1934 bill also intended to allocate state-provided health care for the protection of motherhood. Pieces of the bill were adopted throughout the 1930s, And by the end of the decade and the rise of Japan as a major East Asian imperial power, eugenics were central to the empire. In 1938, the newly formed Ministry of Health and Welfare had a unique eugenics office. The National Eugenics Law, based on that 1934 bill, was passed in May 1940. A National Marriage Counseling Center was established to be headed by Hisomu, who was also the editor of one of the major eugenic journals in Japan, Yusei. Similarly, at the Sato Institute for New Home Life, psychologist Cora Tomiko trained girls to be ideal brides along eugenic lines. Students received extensive sex education, with particular emphasis on the importance of not marrying men with STIs. In the March 1936 issue of Yusei, a journal, which was a journal aimed mostly at a female readership with an all-female editorial board for the first years of its life, a male psychiatrist explained why marriage counseling was so important. Number one, purpose of marriage is the well-being of family and prosperity of the descendants. Number two, 
To achieve well-being of family and prosperity of descendants, one has to be selective about the quality of his or her spouse. Women whose fate is often determined by marriage need to be particularly careful. <laughs> Number three, marriage customs based on superstitions and traditions will be things of the past. Hmm. Number four, rational selection based on eugenics is desirable for modern people and should replace old forms of marriage. It's really interesting how the emphasis here is on like modernization and rational scientific principles Mm -hmm. and getting rid of like superstitions and traditions. Oh, yeah. Number five, choosing a spouse of good quality was as important as avoiding one of poor quality. And ensuring the physical and mental fitness of descendants is a source of the well-being of immediate as well as extended family in a smaller context. It is also the foundation of the betterment of the state and race in a larger context. Finally, number six, popularization of eugenic marriage, which aims at family well-being and the racial purification or minzoku joka is the effort of highest moral value. Yusei, as a general rule, did not counsel women to pursue family limitation uh, significantly. Rather, they preferred to encourage fecundity in their readers because the imperial mission of the East Asian co-prosperity sphere would require many new babies to populate the vast new Japanese empire. It did, as these six points suggest, discourage marriage to quote-unquote undesirables, much like the 1934 eugenic bill and then later the 1940 law. It encouraged women to avoid men with STIs and tuberculosis, as well as alcoholics and lepers. Hmm. All of the major eugenics journals of the early 20th century in Japan emphasize the importance of ending co-sanguineous marriage. According to Jennifer Robertson, 16% of Japanese marriages were blood marriages in the 1920s. That's so bad. These were marriages between first, second, and half cousins. (laughs) See, I told you, half cousins. Uh, As well as marriages to aunts and uncles, uh, John Snow and Daenerys. This is a startlingly high number. That's a that's a lot. Sixteen percent of marriages. That's a lot. Uh, blood marriages, obviously, were extremely common. A sort of strategic endogamy, which is Robertson's term for it. Familiarity was supposed to make more amenable marriages. And this is not like totally unusual. I mean, this no. is was a- absolutely practiced in the United States. I mean, yep my my grandparents were first cousins. Um, uh, they didn't have any children, though. But um, yeah, this is not this is not like totally crazy. But I think maybe the percentage yeah. in the 20th century, yeah. right, is it's is unusual. Yeah. I think by the 20th century in the U.S., it was starting to decline, decline significantly. I've never read anything about that, but that would be very interesting to find out why it declined mm. and how it declined. I wonder if it has to do with eugenics. I wonder too. I bet it does. Uh, I've never seen anything explicitly state that, but who knows. Japanese eugenicists were especially pronatalist, which contrasts sharply with the Margaret Sanger, Marie Stopes approach that we see in the U.S. or in Britain, but which is very much in line with the German eugenicist ideology, even during the Weimar period. Somewhat notably, Margaret Sanger visited Japan and China in the 1920s, but evidently her pro-birth control point of view didn't permeate the powerful members of the emerging Japanese eugenics movement. Men almost exclusively dominated the institutions with any real power. So the fact that one in six Japanese people was married to a close blood relative... That makes it even more (laughs) impactful. (laughs) One in six. One in six was particularly problematic for a movement that was at least in part centered on genetics and the prevention of hereditary disease transmission, but also, as we've seen... Focus on non hereditary, sort of social mm-hmm. hereditariness. Right, right, right. Some eugenicists in Japan, but also in Europe, argued that inbreeding was actually a good idea. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. They pointed back to Francis Galton's thesis about hereditary genius, which suggests that intelligence diminishes the further one gets from the original source. Um, and so thus keeping genetic material circling within a set of blood relative mar- right. blood relative marriages was a preservation tactic. Mm-hmm. Most, though, believe that diseases and birth anomalies were multiplied through inbreeding, which is which is correct. True. Yes. So we return to the issue of blood in Japanese culture and eugenic thought. 
Eugenicists emphasize the importance of the bilineality of national genealogy, that both the mother and the father's bloodlines were important to the health of the nation. This was not reflected in the 1898 Meiji Civil Code. Women could not pass on nationality until a 1985 update to the Civil Code. Up to that point, only patrilineage mattered. So, um, what does that mean? That means from 1898 until 1985, if your mother was Japanese right. and your father was not, you were not Japanese. Okay. I just wanted you to explain that sort of on yeah. mic because I didn't want to say it and get it wrong. But yeah, yeah. so nationality could only be, you could only be considered Japanese if your father was Japanese. If your mother yes. was Japanese until 1985, you technically were Whatever your father was, I'm yes. assuming. Yes, and you're. That's interesting. If you were a Japanese woman and you married, like an American, an American during World you War II, you became American. The J Japan just like, oh, you're not Japanese anymore. That's really Bye. interesting. Yeah, but then you move to the United States and you are too Japanese to be American. Yes, precisely. Um, and so I I want to reemphasize what Sarah was saying that even though this was the law that that nationality was only passed down through the father. Um, eugenicists did believe that you had to focus on the blood fitness of both mother and father. They just weren't being listened to. And so as we've, we've, as we've already suggested, the eugenics movement itself was largely run by and empowered by men in a highly patriarchal society where the markers of tradition were inscribed on women's bodies where the emphasis of the eugenics movement itself was predicated on framing women as mothers to the Japanese race and imperial dream, dream and not as agents who might get to choose if or when they might want to have children. There was very little Japanese feminists could do within the eugenics movement to advocate for women. In some ways, as Sumiko Otsubo and Jennifer Robertson and others have shown, feminists were able to operate within the eugenics movement to affect change in favor of women, things like improved maternal health, education for women so that they could meet men who are not their cousins to marry, mm -hmm. etc., were, after all, better for women than the old ways. But ultimately, the male eugenicists who took baby steps to challenge the patriarchy did so not because they wanted to liberate women, and not because they were feminists, but because they saw women as baby machines. Mm -hmm. And to produce good babies, they needed, to be, they needed to be treated better than they had in the Tokugawa period. So, yay. <laughs> so in the case of Marie Stopes of the United Kingdom, um, who was a eugenicist and was a downright dick about it sometimes, at least there's like this saving grace moment about her where she at least advocated for access to birth control and a woman's right to make most of her own decisions about when and if she got to have babies. Right. Mm -hmm. So like she was an absolute monster in many ways. But at the same time, you've got this kind of like you say, saving grace. There was like this one thing that you could be like, OK, or like even Marie or um, Margaret Mary Sanger, Sanger yeah. right? Margaret Sanger, eugenicist, says many inexcusable things, yeah. but also this pioneer yeah. for women's rights and, and women's uh, reproductive rights. Yes. Otsubo calls the eugenics movement so fixated on really who gets to have sex with whom and who, like lepers, alcoholics, etc., should not be allowed to have sex, um, maternal feminist eugenics. But this is misleading because, as Jennifer Robertson points out, this is not feminism at all, right? It's not advocating for women's rights to anything other than decent access to maternal health care. Like, wow, <laughs> you know, like that should be that should be go without saying, yeah. right? Robertson calls this a gynocentric eugenics, which is a more effective way of categorizing what is happening in Japan. So eugenic marriage became a major focus of the Japanese eugenics movement, counseling on favorable matches based on blood and identity. 
A leader in this movement was Aikida Shigenori, who was editor of another of the major eugenics journals, and who published articles about the importance of monogamy. Monogamy was the foundation of eugenics, Mm -hmm. but also pro-physical education, nutrition lessons, group hiking, (laughs) and of course, wholesome folk dancing in the countryside. But you know, that does remind me of the Germans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very folky. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Shigenori, who was a journalist and eugenicist, founded a eugenic exercise movement association, which primarily targeted girls or women in pursuit of the health and fitness of the Japanese race Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. through female genes. He emphasized that romantic relationships could be built through co-education and hobbies rather than kinship. Mm -hmm. Meet meet a cute guy hiking. Instead of your cousin at the family barbecue. (laughs) As you'll recall, this was important because one reason co-sanguinous marriages were so common is that the Japanese believed a marriage would be more harmonious if the couple knew each other, Mm. and in most cases as cousins or some other semi-close blood relation before the marriage. So, I'm sorry, while you were talking about, like, wholesome folk dancing in the countryside, so, like, that is, first of all, hilarious, right? That that's, like a eugenic thing but again not just the germans like the germans obviously very into like oh like you should marry a good aryan man who wears his lederhosen right Mm -hmm, all of those propaganda mm -hmm. images of like strong blonde men and lederhosen but the americans like the the resurgence of square dancing oh yeah comes from this same like line of thinking especially the programs in many states where it was required in gym class yep that students learn to to square dance was specifically about this yes was about like the wholesomeness of country folk dancing <laughs> right and what that like a particular sort of very obviously white vision mm-hmm. of the american people the and American also race. very heterosexual because the partners were supposed of course. to be a boy and a girl of course swing Absolutely. your partner round and round did you have to square dance oh yeah oh yeah we even in too. the middle of yeah. nowhere vermont we elvira had to yep elvira yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. oh yeah i could square dance right now if you wanted me to we also had to line dance we didn't have to do that we had to do the boot scoot and boogie that's more <laughs> damaging to your psyche obviously in the long term Discouraging inbreeding and encouraging young people to find appropriate and eugenic spouses was the primary goal of the various eugenics journals and magazines. In April 1942, while Japan was fighting a war of imperialism, you know, by the by, Shashin Shuho, a Photography Weekly, printed a two-page spread on the ideal eugenic couple. In the image, which Jennifer Robertson reproduced in her fascinating article, the spread is framed by a young Japanese man on one side and a young Japanese woman on the other. The man is dressed in a Western-style suit, complete with a tie, and his hair is cropped short and presumably combed back with liberal amounts of pomade. The woman is dressed in a traditional kimono, wears silk stockings under traditional sandals. According to the text, the ideal woman would be 154 centimeters tall, weigh 51 kilograms, have a chest size of 80 centimeters, and be 25 years old or younger. The ideal man would be 165 centimeters tall, 58 kilograms, chest size of 84 centimeters, 25 years or younger. Both of them, of course, free from disease with normal genealogies. Accompanying the spread were the 10 rules of marriage. 1. Choose a lifetime partner. 2. Choose a partner healthy in mind and body. 3. Exchange health certificates. Mm -hmm. 4. Choose someone without bad genes. 5. Avoid marriage with blood relatives. (laughs) 6. Marry as soon as possible. Hmm. 7. Discard superstitions and quaint customs. 8. Obey your parents. (laughs) Nine, have a simple and economical wedding. Ten, and reproduce for the nation. Lay back and think of your country. (laughs) (laughs) In addition to the cutouts of the couple, there were photographs of a simple, austere, I think wartime marriage Hmm. ceremony, the couple's health certificates, and a terrifying cartoon (laughs) of the ideal results of this union. 
eight children. That's too many children. That's too many children. And especially if she only has a, what was it, 80, 80 centimeter chest? Jeez Louise. <laughs> Poor girl. The extensive caption below the image reads, Only people can accomplish the construction of Greater East Asia. Superior people are generally greatly needed for our future. There is one condition that must be fulfilled in order to increase the number of superior people, and that is the promotion and, and encouragement of marriage. For every Japanese child born, seven children are born in China, five in India, and three in the Soviet Union. However important it is to increase the population, the birth of the physically weak and mentally impaired children will harm the national body. Therefore, let us be sure to think carefully about marriage and to transact a wholesome union in order to bring forth superior offspring. Then, in 10 or 20 years, the strong children who will lead East Asia will have increased in number to the point whereby Showa 35, the population of the main islands of Japan, will have topped 100 million. Is that not a wonderful scenario to contemplate? Yeah. Um, two side notes here. First, again, super, super similar to German conversations yes. about reproduction during 100%. the war, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. again, um, uh, a colonialist empir empiricist mm -hmm. project, empiricist is not the right word, but colonialist project, yeah. right? You need people to, to populate yeah. the, you the, know. The Lebensraum. Right, exactly. Um, but then the other thing I was going to say, this um, only people can accomplish the construction of greater East Asia. Superior people are greatly needed for our future. And then this kind of going through statistics of for every Japanese child born, seven are born in China. Obviously, yeah. all of these lesser inferior peoples. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, Steve King, the the. I, the representative from, I think he's from Iowa, yeah, um, who is just like an unmitigated white supremacist, mm -hmm. just a, a really terrible, terrible person, a couple years ago made an, a very similar statement about the United States mm. uh, in regards to immigration and yeah. said, you know, we're never going to be able to build, rebuild American civilization with other people's babies. Mm. And so like white Americans need to have more children and we're failing um, we're committing a version, a new version of race suicide mm. by allowing these other people to come in and out reproduce us because they're, you know, like animals. They reproduce like animals. Mm. And so we need to both control that, but we need to reproduce more. Yeah. So this all seems very, you know, oh, uh, it happened 70 years ago. Um, but it, no. so much of this is still in our, our, our politics and yeah. in our lexicon today. For sure. So while a lot of the theory, policy, and practice of eugenics in Japan comes down to reproduction and controlling sex, in the course of constructing these ideas, the Japanese are also forging new ideas about blood, race, and Japanese identity. Before the 17th century, blood was unclean, specifically menstrual blood, obviously, and so women were basically considered unclean. This was a nice way for women to be excluded from most public spaces and for upper class women in particular to be sort of squirreled away. This blood misogyny has long tentacles on the status of women in Japan well after the Taisho period and well after the Americans rewrote the Constitution of 1948. Women, for example, were not recognized as Japanese nationals on their own or as purveyors of Japanese citizenship, as we mentioned, until 1985. A woman takes up or absorbs the citizenship of her husband. A Japanese woman who had a child out of wedlock before 1985, the child of that you know relationship, was not considered Japanese itself unless a Japanese daddy claimed it. Yeah, uh, we are angry about this as well. Um, but all is better now. Still you know, rampant sexism, but at least they addressed that you know Particular citizenship issue. issue in 1985. So because there was this long-standing association of blood and uncleanliness, femininity, uncleanliness slash femininity, blood itself was not really conceived of as a defining trait of family or inheritance. Mm. Adoption was widespread and common in Japan right up through the 20th century, particularly when a family needed a male heir to pass inheritances down to. They'd just find any old boy child and <laughs> ta-da! Healthy male heir. Mm. It's not until the Tokugawa period that ideas about pure-bloodedness and citizenship begin to take shape. 
Japan is currently a nation established on jus sanguinis. This means that nationality is passed down through blood. In the U.S., nationality is both jus sanguinis and jus soli, meaning if you are born on U.S. soil, you are automatically an American citizenship. Birthright citizenship, 14th Amendment, booyah. Booyah. This is not the case in Japan. Naturalization is possible, but difficult. And really, it's up to parentage or blood. Until 1985, it was exclusively based on just your patrilineage. So blood had, by the 1930s, taken on a whole new dimension in Japan. It did not shed its, wholly shed its earlier negative associations, but was also part of a new language and discourse of race, good marriage and reproduction, public health, and Japanese imperialism. Carl Landsteiner, a Viennese biologist, is credited with identifying the four blood types in 1909, building on a couple of decades of attempting to understand why people got sick with transfusions of some kinds of blood, but not others. Like genetics, this new scientific information was absorbed by Japanese scientists. But also, like genetics or pathology or whatever, um, it did not stop in laboratories. According to one source, the first linking of blood type to temperament in Japan was in 1916, when Kamada Hara published a research paper purporting to link blood group with temperament. In 1927, Takeji Furukawa, a psychologist, and as evidenced by the number of psychologists published in the popular eugenics magazines, apparently their opinions were very highly valued in Japan, published a paper titled The Study of Temperament Through Blood Type. He based his findings, quote unquote, on a study of 11 of his family members Mm. in which he assessed their personality types and then linked those to their blood types. I bet they were thrilled about that. (laughs) Less than 20 years after Landsteiner introduced the blood types, this wildly unprovable pseudoscience emerged in Japan. German eugenicists, too, embarked on a range of experiments having to do with blood and culture. Certainly, the entire concept of Jewishness as a racial, blood-carried condition is rooted in the same sort of scientific thinking. Quote-unquote. And yeah. like, but also not like, because to be clear, the Japanese didn't commit a genocide against type Bs. Correct. Right? Uh, though some eugenicists advocated for their sterilization, that didn't make it into the final 1940 national eugenic law. Mm-hmm. So like, but also not like German eugenics, this blood type discrimination gained legs of its own. In the early 1930s, the Japanese government tried to see if this crazy theory had any bearing on real life. Unsurprisingly, their research on soldiers, blood types, and temperaments proved completely useless and unproductive. But still, government officials, employers, and courtship rituals were predicated on desirable and undesirable blood type candidates for every social and professional interaction. The theory, or probably we should call it the myth, was repopularized by a journalist with no medical background in the 1970s with the publication of Understanding Affinity by Blood Type, which became a bestseller, followed by Blood Type Humanics in 1973. I wish uh, I wish that we could have found English translations of either of these texts, but we could not, unfortunately. The journalist, again, like the editors of the major eugenics journals, who were also effectively the leaders of the public health initiatives, marriage counseling centers, and etc., relied on the flawed study from 1927, but still made lots of money and preyed on a stereotype that had really become quite popular. It died down by the 1990s, but we're back in a resurgence of this fad today. Excellent. This has, we cannot stress enough, no scientific or statistically significant basis, any more than astrology or racial stereotypes. According to one report, discrimination is so bad in Japan today that the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare had to include a statement about not asking people about their blood type in a job interview in their guideline to fair employment selection self-inspection. Because employers were assuming the worst of B and AB candidates. Politicians like Ryu Matsumoto blamed their bad behavior on their blood type. Yep. After making inappropriate comments in the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, uh, 
Matsumoto said, My blood types B, which means I can be irritable and impetuous, and my intentions don't always come across. My wife called me earlier to, re to point that out. I think I need to reflect about that. Oh, my God. Jeez. In 2007, The Guide to Yourself, based on blood type, sold 5.4 million copies in Japan. In pop culture, blood type horoscopes are discussed on morning talk shows. There are countless television, anime, and film plot lines that center around bad relationships with bees, like the Korean rom-com, My Boyfriend is a Type B. <laughs> <laughs> and while type Bs are believed to be unpredictable, passionate, but irresponsible, type As and Os are lauded. Well, I mean... I am a very good I'm example. I'm also an A. Oh, yes. 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 Of course we're A. In fact, I mean, an A plus, if you, yeah. Oh, I'm an A plus too. It, it means everything. Yes. <laughs> we just, <laughs> we just we're did like, it. We just did it. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is terrible. Oh, but we are type A's. <laughs> Uh, anyway, the Japanese were confident in the promise of former Red Sox pitcher Daisuke Matsuzaka when he joined the American team in 2006 with a $100 million contract because he is a type O, a warrior in blood topology. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not because he's a good pitcher, but because he's got type O blood. Type O blood. It's uh, it's fascinating. It's wild. It's is wild. What it is. <laughs> but ultimately, the point is that this pseudoscience of blood type personalities is a product of Japanese modernization, both of its westernization and Japanization. Like the other eugenic policies, many of which are still part of the Japanese law code today, the science behind blood type personalities was forged at the crossroads of the invention of a Japanese race the changing conceptualizations of blood, and the popularization of eugenic ideas in various publications and public discourses. And hopefully, as this episode has communicated, this kind of thing doesn't just happen. It's a process. It's socially constructed. And if a blood type personality horoscope can be invented, it can also be dismantled. Knowing the history of these issues, how they intersect with other histories of oppression, of racism, parading as progress, of imperialism, and the like, is one step forward in finding a better way to relate to and treat one another. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one thing that does occur to me is that I was trying to, to think if this is something that I've heard of, like, in the United States, people, like associating personality with blood types and i don't think i ever have but i know that there are um ideas like there, there's a pseudo scientific like pseudo health which of which there's lots of stuff like a you know um what's the word i'm looking for like quack medicine yeah, sort of quackery, yeah. theory about your diet and your blood type that there was like a really um a, a similar kind of argument made in a book about how to eat for your blood type um and if you just ate in a way that like matched your blood type then like all of your diseases would like vanish oh yeah mm. yeah so all that to say that like maybe this doesn't exactly translate to the united states but we have similar yeah thinking right we we always yeah. We are always trying to find ways to link something to a biological, right? A biological reality. Like, oh, it's my blood type or, oh, it's my... Since the... Um, whatever. Not like... I think that's probably a 19th, 20th century thing, right? That that desire to link sort of tradition, folk medicine-y kind of superstition to... It's hard science, science exactly roots, right is very much tied up in this whole phenomenon that is effectively mm -hmm. the natural sciences of the nineteenth since since the enlightenment right well, and I wonder too, and this might be a little bit more like out there, but I wonder too if some of this same thinking is going on when people run to Ancestry.com and send them their blood samples mm -hmm. or their split samples, I should probably say, and yeah. have them, like, search for their ancestry, right, in their DNA um, as if that means anything. Yes. As if it has any bearing on anything. And it's often not even accurate. Yeah. Right? It's because of the samples that they 
compare them to, mm-hmm. they're constantly changing. That's why people will get like updated reports because they're mm-hmm. like, oh, we added this new um, database of this kind of information. And we found out that, oh, actually, you're, you know, 0.0003% Sub Saharan African. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Again, and then people will read them and be like, oh, well, that that's why. Yeah. I have high cheekbones or yeah. that's why I have always had an affinity to this particular religion yes. because I'm yeah. actually one eighth Ashkenazi Jew or something. Yeah. You know what right, I mean? Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean. Cause it's, it seems like it's inborn then. It's like, yeah. it has nothing to do with our environment or the randomness and contingencies of being a human. It's like, oh no, that's in my blood. It's in my blood. Yeah. Yeah. Like my druid blood. Yeah. Well, yeah. Your druid blood is actually very useful. You, yeah. I you... can see the future and yep. I know when things are happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And I'm good at scratch off tickets and gambling. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm interested, too, in this, the the Japanese-ness citizenship thing. I, oh, my God. I would love to know how that translates to people like in the United States, who are who are of Japanese descent, you know, especially mm. like, especially the the children and grandchildren of relationships between American GIs mm-hmm. who were stationed there after, during, and after World War Two. Yeah, well, that period between World War Two and eighty five, any children born right. of those unions would not be Japanese. I know, and th- do you think that? I mean, that can't be a coincidence, right? Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I'm, but I, I don't know, because there's there's also this vein in some of the eugenicists of Japan's thought that unions between white Europeans would be would positive. be advantageous. Right. Yeah. There's that split that yeah. it would be like better or actually would be worse because it'd be watering down the Japanese ness. Yeah. But then, right. so the since the idea of intermarriage being good died in popularity mm-hmm. and instead was replaced by the, the if other you do version. this it'll be watering down mm-hmm. then maybe the that was a little intentional mm-hmm. because it because those the children of those unions would have been shunned and would not mm-hmm. have been considered japanese mm-hmm. it makes a lot of sense within yeah. that sort of way of thinking yeah that's really that's really fascinating especially considering that those people you know, many of those people end up living in the United States yeah. where they're too Asian yeah. to be, you know, American. Yeah. I mean, socially, obviously, they can be American citizens, but right. still maybe not treated particularly well, yeah. be the subject of racism. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, you know, that's got to that must be a really disorienting feeling that you can't mm-hmm. really you, you're you not really, quote unquote, Japanese. Mm-hmm. And you're not really American. Yeah. So like, don't, you know. I wonder, I didn't look it up, but I wonder if the 1985 law retroactively made all those children Japanese. Oh, that's a good question. Hmm. I don't know. I should have Googled that. That's very interesting. (laughs) The the way that we think about citizenship, and every country thinks about citizenship so differently. I mean, I know that, like, even if you have, I don't remember, I don't know the exact, you might know, but, like, can't you apply for, like, Irish citizenship? If your grandmother was Irish. Right. Yes. Which is wild. Yeah. Right? Americans would lose their shit. Yeah. If you could, you know, get American citizenship. They don't even like birthright citizenship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People are actively trying to get rid of the 14th Amendment mm. to get rid of the birthright citizenship clause in it. Yeah. And to imagine being like, well, my grandma was American. So I'm American, you know? Yeah. That's very interesting. So why did Ireland, do you think, think uh, of it in that way? Because they lost so many people, so many people, just hemorrhaged people from night, you know, yeah, 19th through century through the 1990s, yeah. early 1990s. Yeah. So the, the impetus was to encourage those people to feel like they're still part of mm-hmm. Ireland and to come back. Mm, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. It is super interesting. And it, I missed the cut. I think oh, it's my great grandparents. It's my great great grandparents. Great great. Because it's it was my dad's great grandparents, so he wasn't eligible. If, Interesting. If his parents, if before my grandpa died, if he had applied, 
then my dad could have applied mm. and then I could have applied, which would have been nice. But is Ireland the only country that does that? That's the only one I know of, but I want Scotland to do that. I want to say then James could be a dual citizen. That Israel be... might have something similar. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. I don't know. The but there, announced, it seems like there are a lot of countries that have a lot of dual citizens. Oh, yeah. For sure. You know, so yeah. like countries like Israel and Ireland that would yeah. have. I think and Russia, Italy, maybe Italy has something similar. Also, maybe yes. for similar reasons because of the immigration. Yeah. I mm-hmm. Don't quote me on that. I yeah. have no idea what I'm talking about. We're just about, speculating. But, yeah. Yeah. But that's very it, it's interesting to me how those issues of citizenship work. Yeah. And, and listeners, if you are dual citizens or yeah, yeah. if you know any of these things that we're just completely I, speculating on we'd love to hear i'm thinking of you. a couple of people in some of these examples that i'm yeah. using i don't want to name them obviously but i'm hoping that they'll give us yeah they'll, they'll chime, chime in, in in pod squad and talk yeah to yeah, us. yeah yeah and if you're a listener who is not part of the pod squad please join us oh and then yes please. On, on facebook dig history pod squad and and join this conversation we'd love to hear about it yes definitely um, also, good news, you can finally learn about your affinities and shortcomings per your blood type. Yes. You don't even have to read the 1970 Understanding Affinity Through Blood Type or oh. the 1927 study. You just have oh. to zip over to whatsmybloodtype.org and journey through your self-realization. <gasps> Let's do that. Let's all do it. Well, we already know that we are superior to all others. Yeah, I mean, A+, plus okay. is yeah. obviously the best. It, what's Dan? Dan! He's playing me. What's your blood type? <laughs> <laughs> Dan, isn't it? Oh, like that. he's a warrior. Oh, well, the yeah, he is a warrior. Yeah, because mm-hmm. he was in the navy. Yeah, James is an A, as well. Mm. Controlling, yeah, but good. Controlling, but good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's funny. We've taken a bunch of these, not the blood type one, but a bunch of these like personality ones. Oh yeah, yeah this yeah. is one that a lot of like um, a lot of Christians are really into called the Enneagram, which yeah. is actually really fascinating. But um, we took it and we're every time we take them, we're like always are the same thing. Oh, so like we're both A's. Oh, we're both threes on the Enneagram. Isn't yeah. that weird? It is weird. We were both. I can't remember what exactly it is. I have it written on my phone in the um, Myers-Briggs. We had got the same thing mm-hmm. in Myers-Briggs, too. It's mm-hmm. really weird. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. You have to go to a. What's my blood personality type, type yeah. thing and find out. Um, yeah. So thank you as always for listening. If you have a minute, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes yes, please. or wherever you get your podcasts. Those five star ratings and warm and fuzzy words help us help other people find us. And they make us feel nice inside. And that too. We need so that. Don't, don't say mean things about us. Only nice things and five stars. And we love to hear from you. We love, love, love to hear from you. You can tweet at us. You can leave us comments on our transcript pages at digpodcast.org. You can send us an email at hello at digpodcast.org. You can join our Dig History Pod Squad that we just mentioned. Or we'll even allow you to slide into our Instagram DMs. Um, just kidding. Uh, but we are at dig underscore history just about on all of those platforms. And we love talking to you and hearing about what you liked or what you want to know more about in our episodes. And if you ever have an, a, an issue or a topic that you want to not just add to the conversation, but that you'd like us to do an episode on, you know, let us know. Yes, absolutely. If you enjoy this podcast, consider giving us a dollar per month through our Patreon account. Every dollar makes what we do more doable. And then you're a paying member of the coven. And so when the apocalypse happens, you can ascend with us. Yes. <laughs> April's druid blood will save us all. <laughs> I am the principal. Thanks again. We hope you enjoyed this one. Lots more eugenics to come. Uh, I guess in a like nice <laughs> Lots more or, eugenics to come. In a sad or whatever depressing way. Yeah. Um, bye. Bye. This podcast was produced by the historians of Dig, Elizabeth Garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, April Earls. Thanks for listening. Okay, this is like so stream of consciousness. Sorry, yeah. And Japanization movement. And Japanization movement. (laughs) Don't laugh, I have to do it again. (laughs) That as many as 3,000 Oyatoi Gaikokujin. Okay, I'm going to say it again so it doesn't sound so stupid. An obstetric... Why can't I say that word? While most American eugenicists were geneticists...
<laughs> wow. <laughs> There's a lot of is yeah. in here. In lockstep with Na Na uh, Nancy. <laughs> the Nancys. The Nancys. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm. 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 It reminds me of a certain a certain couple that so many of us were shipping so hard and then realized that it was a lot of ant bombing. Ant bombing. <laughs> oh, yes. Jon Snow and Daenerys. <laughs> yes. But now the new ship is Jon Snow and Sansa, in which it would be cousins, and not aunt and nephew. <laughs> oh, God. Dreams can come true. That would be a seriously... Um, seriously strange relationship. <laughs> Talk about like baggage, right? Like we were siblings. Now we're technically not siblings. So let's do it. <laughs> well, that's uh, the one that I, I didn't read about that one. I read about Sansa and Theon. Uh, no. Well, after that last episode where they were like, oh, let's hug. But they can just I will be protect siblings. you forever. I think that's what it was. It was supposed right. to be like, I'm going to I want to be like your brother again. Yes. Anyway, anyway. Exactly. Anyway. Let's just turn this into a Game of Thrones theory podcast. We should actually do that. We haven't talked about Game of Thrones, me and you, and I'm upset about it. Okay. That's why the Targaryens were were yes. known for marrying each other because they, they were so... They want to keep the blood. Yeah. Exactly. Ah, yeah, yeah. see, this is it's like... All, this is actually mm. an episode about, uh, <laughs> about Game of Thrones.